start with this. Cataclysis uh, from Viscous Plot is actually the title uh, I decided to present here. But uh, with also experiments I did two days before coming here, I wanted to be a little bit more aggressive towards the end, maybe uh, remove the carbonate hosted faults uh, and be more generic to see a little bit the big picture. But weakening <laughs> along faults, we have seen it uh, in the nice introduction today and the other days too. Uh, why is it, is it important? Because for the during the ruptures, during earthquakes, uh, uh, the, the rupture tip uh, propagates uh, at very fast speed uh, and uh, e it is fitted by a stress transfer that comes from the, the whole fault. Uh, and this process is enhanced uh, if uh, the fault itself has a low friction coefficient uh, because the it's sliding at a lower velocity and needs to transfer the stress towards the tip to, me to render the mechanism more efficient. In order to do that, uh, along the fault uh, there are thermally activated mechanisms that redu reduce the the fault strength uh, by dynamic weakening, what is called dynamic weakening. As shown in the previous pre presentation, uh, we, we have this nice graph that uh, uh, comprises many, di ma many different uh, experiments that all show that uh, at high velocity the, the friction coefficient is reduced, but every single experiment done with different material needs a different explanation. So we have different weakening mechanisms, each with its own physical characterization, more or less empirical, and uh, some of them were re really recent. For example, the uh, diffusion assisted green boundary sliding that has been uh, hypothesized to work, uh, in, for example, in calcite or in carbonates in general. This, was the f this is the focus of the first part of the presentation. And uh, so let's investigate the calcite. We do experiments on the rotary machine, that is the classic uh, squeeze your, uh, that squeezes your rock uh, in an uniaxial direction and starts shearing it with a uh, with the rotation of the, the upper cylinder. And here I show just the experiments done with the uh, maximum normal stress we can achieve, 25 megapascals, normal stress, uh, and uh, high velocity, 1.4 meter per second. What you obtain out of this machine, the mechanical data, is a, is a nice weakening curve that you all uh, recognize that works more or less for all materials. In calcite, it's quite uh, uh, nice to see because it uh, has uh, four distinct stages that we uh, observe. So let's just observe the evolution of friction coefficient with displacement. You have uh, uh, slip hardening, first uh, stage one, uh, rapid drop of friction coefficient uh, during stage two, a sort of slowly evolving uh, st condition where the friction coefficient remain low, and a uh, fourth stage when you restrength. And this is uh, this happens always when the machine decelerates to stop. And these are four experiments stopped at different uh, uh, displacements that uh, I used to investigate the evolution of microstructure. You see that they plot on top of each other, so there is a nice reproducibility. The temperature, of course, rises most when the, the, the friction coefficient is high, then becomes lower and lower and drops during the deceleration phase. Microstructures, we recover the sample after, the, after each experiment. And you already see that the sample uh, shows the nice reflecting surface that um, uh, it's seen pretty much every uh, material uh, shared at these uh, high velocities. But our focus was not on the mirrors as usual, uh, as is usually done, but we try to recover the full sandwich and it has been a game changer for my project because we try to recover from top to bottom what is the whole architecture of the principal slip zone, not just uh, what is believed to be a slip zone itself. So we cut like in a parallel to the, to the velocity vector and we explore it with, uh, um, at, the mic at, the, at the electron microscope. This is what you obtain. Again, we see this is the indentation of the lower cylinder and this is the, to uh, the indentation of the top cylinder. And uh, more or less, I, I managed to recover all of the stages. From stage one, we have uh, um, the, um, the characteristic archi architecture of widespread uh, cataclastic deformation and a very well uh, localized uh, principal slip zone that is still cataclastic. Uh, and that uh, localizes almost immediately at the beginning of the experiment, just after a few millimeters of slip. Then we see the progressive evolution of this principal slip zone into something different. Uh, stage two, just after the weakening, it still seems uh, cataclastic, but has sharp boundaries and even sharper when you reach stage three and stays always the same, uh, bounding betwe between two straight boundaries. It will be more clear in the next slides. And during stage four, you have uh, uh, an over a brittle overprint on your principal slip zone. But what we are interested in here I keep forgetting this, uh, is we want to, to zoom out into the principal slip zone comprised between two uh, 
uh, these two flat boundaries that uh, um, are, are presented by the mirrors when you uh, open the sample. And uh, zooming in, this is the this is the uh, the texture. So uh, the the formation of the principal zip zone is in a volume, even during the dynamic weakening. Uh, and this uh, it, it's in a principal zip zone that has a finite thickness. Uh, and this thickness is pretty much homogeneous throughout uh, the, the sample. And inside you see a small grain size, and a particular texture is quite uh, resembling tho that of uh, natural ultramilonites that are seen in the ductile regime, not in the brittle regime. And uh, it's characterized by triple junctions, homogeneous grain si fairly homogeneous grain size, and an oblique foliation. And the porosity is very low when uh, it's in uh, the TEM. Now, uh, with uh, this texture, and that is closely resembled the ultramilonites, we uh, try to hypothesize that uh, probably, uh, since the grain size is much bigger outside, it can be controlled by grain size sensitive creep. And, uh, but uh, this is just a textural uh, evidence. And uh, with this, we provide an initial conceptual model where the, the weakening is, uh, is reached when the, a critical temperature is reached, but it's also prepared by the initial stages of localization that produces a small grain size. So ignore the model for now, we make the long story short. Uh, we have uh, a transition from brittle cataclysis, prepares a principal slip zone where you build up the temperature and becomes gradually more viscous when the temperature increases and you reduce the, uh, the um, its viscosity and it, it turns into a, a macroscopic friction coefficient. And stage four, embrittlement back again when the conditions uh, go away of temperature drops and uh, you slow down, you go away from uh, the viscous flow and you go back to brittle regime again. But uh, are you convinced that this is uh, actually a viscous flow? We need more independent evidence. One way to do it is by acoustic uh, using acoustic emissions on the apparatus. So I've, uh, uh, we have designed a, a small sample holder called the Exapus that hosts uh, uh, some uh, piezoelectric acoustic sensors that uh, measure the vibrations coming out of the, the acoustic emissions coming from the sample. And what you obtain is a raw data, voltage against time, that can be analyzed using the fast Fourier transform, analyzing basically the spectrum that is uh, inside uh, each, um, each part of the, um, of the experiment. You can visualize it pretty well using the spectrogram. Spectrogram is quite simple. Uh, after fast Fourier transform, you obtain a frequency with this relatively uh, relative uh, intensity that is uh, represented from blue to yellow, higher uh, intensity going toward you in time. You already see that uh, this will be the experiment, that you can recognize that the experiment is non-homogeneous. Acoustic emissions have a different uh, uh, style throughout the experiment. And if I plot uh, on the top uh, the mechanical data, I already see that uh, stage three is, uh, we can consider it silent compared to the other stages. And we have a lot of uh, acoustic emissions coming out after the, the end of experiments that is correlated to thermal cracking, enhancing even more what is the brittle overprint and uh, hindering a little bit what is the interpretation of our experiments. So stage three is silent compared to the others. And this is typical of something that is flowing viscously, for example, rather than a cataclysmic flow. Uh, even more evidence is added when we uh, want to explore further the weakening mechanisms. And a way to do that, again, we have seen in the previous, uh, previous two uh, sessions, even better, is using the EBS electron backscatter diffraction analysis, where we test the, the orientation of, uh, of crystals and uh, the intensity of our texture. I will focus more on the stereographic projection because it's more immediate, but uh, we've done also disorientation analysis, orientation maps, and so on, full analysis. And uh, today I will show just what's happening inside the principal zip zone. You can also assess what's happening in the outer layers, and they add morphological information, but let's keep it short. So starting from stage one, mechanical data shows that uh, the inside the principal zip zone, there is a, a sort of CPO, so crystals are slightly oriented, but uh, it's not so intense. This is, uh, has, uh, there is a paper coming out from uh, the Murtas et al. that shows that this is probably due to, in the in cataclastic processes, is uh, um, uh, uh, oriented uh, fracturing and twinning of calcite that provides a, sli a slightly lower CPO. It changes completely when we go into stage two. Stage two, just after the, the, the weakening, CPO bank becomes very strong is monoclin. You see the repetition of the A axis, uh, and the C axis is very well oriented with a strong intensity of your CPO. Then, uh, 
when we go at the beginning of stage three, when the, you have the stable uh, principal zip zone with a, a finite thickness that stays the same, the CPU becomes weaker and even more weak with a progressive uh, displacement. And uh, this can be compared not uh, it cannot be compared to high velocity stuff because it has not been done before, but to low velocity experiments. It's not so dissimilar to what they've saw in, uh, in calcite uh, at uh, much lower strain rates. Here we're talking about uh, strain rates 10 to the fourth compared to strain rates 10 to the minus four, for example. And um, uh, this evolution of the CPO has been interpreted previously, like uh, cataclases, we have a low CPO, um, um, twinning can uh, add a little bit of it. But uh, green size insensitive creeper will orientate your crystal favorably to the, to the stress field. But then when green size uh, sensitive creeper like a diffusion kicks in and becomes a, a viable mechanism to deform your, uh, your, uh, your, um, your material, becomes weaker and weaker. This has been predicted mathematically by Wheeler, but not really shown. In this case, uh, you can imagine from this stage to this stage, the finest strains are 20,000 and more in a, that th uh, thin principal zip zone. Okay. This was calcite. Uh, I've tried to convince you that this is actually a myelonite, uh, even at very high strain rates, something that has not been uh, uh, idealized before. But uh, calcite is just one material. Can we expand it to the other materials? Because uh, as we have seen from the previous presentation, this works for a, a wide range of materials, and they seem to have the same, uh, the same evolution. Despite having different uh, um, uh, weakening mechanisms that are uh, material dependent. Let's try to unify a little bit. So I did, uh, again, um, well, lack of a general is a bit, bit bold, but uh, probably what I want to do here is to unify and, uh, and try to see if the materials respond the same way. So we do experiments the same way we've done with calcite, but using different materials. In this case, I choose uh, materials that typically don't melt, uh, in a, as, a, as seen in the experiments, but belong to different class, mineralogical classes with different bonds. We have a carbonates on top, calcite, the uh, classic one is easy to use, anhydrite, sulfates, sodium uh, chloride, halides, uh, and even olivine, but it was two days before coming here, so uh, believe me, it uh, shows the same trend you will see after, but I didn't have the time to plot it here. And this is the classic way of uh, representing them. Uh, experiments, so displacement against friction coefficient. But what if we take into account the temperature and the stress rather than the friction coefficient? We plot it in an Arrhenius type, Arrhenius space. This is what you obtain. Basically, the experiment is evolving from right to left uh, with increasing temperature, the inverse of the temperature, and shear stress. And we see, uh, this is just uh, Gabbro from uh, Nielsen in uh, 2008 uh, that uh, sh uh, already shows a linear relationship uh, that is typical of melts because they show a Arrhenius type relationship. But it works also for stage three in, uh, in experiments done with other materials. For example, this is calcite, the pink one, and it can be approximated by just an Arrhenius type relationship uh, where you can find uh, A and B pretty easily. And uh, in, uh, in calcite, I, I tried to demonstrate that that was a myelonite. And myelonites, we know that uh, depend on temperature in an Arrhenius type uh, fashion. But, and uh, a melt as well is an Arrhenius type dependency. So we have viscous flow subsolidus and viscous flow supersolidus. And what about the other three materials? So ex let's explore the, the, the textures. If we go and do the same stuff that we've done for calcite, again, calcite was that one, uh, principal zip zone finite thickness. The same is dolomite. You can't see it really well because you don't have the big sintering at the borders, but uh, this is a, a zone of reduced grain size with a, uh, you can find an oblique foliation and uh, uh, fortunately it's very difficult to clean, but all of them, and it's very well seen in, uh, in sodium chloride and uh, anhydride, it's always a volume that is deforming. And there is a little bit of brittle overprint, as I said before, that might uh, hinder your interpretation, but the formation appears to be in a volume effectively. So where thermal, uh, thermal effects can uh, involve uh, uh, different uh, weakening mechanisms, not um, necessarily strictly uh, diffusion, uh, diffusion creep or so on, but uh, distributed uh, in, a, in a volume with the salt, you can calculate a viscosity. So just a brief recap. So just for what uh, concerns calcite, you can have uh, ultramyelonites and that deform a very high strain rate, something that was not uh, actually seen before. And uh, the co-seismic creep mechanism that uh, uh, provide the weakening mechanism might not be so different from a, a much lower strain rate uh, myelonite. We just need to explore it at the sub-micron scale because the grain size there is much, much finer. It's 
below the micron size, so the kinetic might, might be different. And uh, if we expand the vision, we see that the materials, independently if it's uh, 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 subsolidus or supersolidus, uh, at least when they are allowed uh, to uh, evolve spontaneously, uh, localizing, they can uh, show an Arrhenius type dependence and have their own viscosity. And that can be uh, the, the fashion of earthquakes of being viscous rather than brittle. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>